Uh, we're going to talk today about the uh, what we call the emergent economic engine, uh, where we try to understand the economic impact of the crisis. So today we're going to talk, uh, I hope you can see the slides, otherwise somebody needs to shout at me. We're going to talk to today a little bit of what we do, what the Emergent Alliance actually is. Uh, then we're going to talk about two tools which are also available on GitHub. Uh, one is we call the cookie cutter uh, and are going to present that. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague from IBM, uh, Alvaro. Uh, so I'm Rolls Royce and Alvaro is IBM. Um, and then he's going to talk about the economic, uh, uh, the emergent economic engine, which is a simulation model. So what is the uh, emergent alliance? Um, well, back in, in mid-March, when, when we all saw that there is this pandemic outbreak, uh, we all wondered what to do. And because we're all based in, in, in big corporates, uh, one of the initial thinking was like, is to do with planability, with what, what is the future going to bring? And this sparked the idea in uh, lots of people look, are you looking into the health side of things? Is there anything that we can do to improve the planability? Like how, how long will things take and what will be the impact onto the economy? With this pandemia which is a first of a kind experience for definitely for me and probably for most of us so um, it's a it's an alliance of people's not-for-profit organization registered in the uk where actually lots of uh, corporates are joining so two of them ibm rolls royce are presenting today there is other contributors uh, there's a web page out there which you're also going to bring up uh, at the end uh, of uh, this presentation so who are we uh, even though we are big corporate uh, uh, players, we, we, we actually, it was the first time they actually started to collaborate and it was a fascinating experience, it was uh, really, really interesting, really, very exciting to do that. So we, we share the common passion for data, we, we share the common vision around being able to do some good uh, to understand what the pandemic actually uh, is. and. This matters a lot to uh, big corporates, of course. We, we actually are working agile, so we do uh, trial and, and error. And we fail fast, we fail hard, and then we're just going to get up again and continue uh, after we've learned our lessons. I'm going to talk quickly about the scope of work that our team has been doing uh, since around about mid-May of this year. Uh, we had a number of work streams uh, that we, we, we try to cover the whole area around uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, so this was a uh, first piece of work, which uh, obviously has to take into account the health situation. So this is uh, the predicting of the risk index for certain areas. Currently, we do that for UK, Germany, France, Italy, and also South Korea. Um, Second thing I'm going to talk today is about the uh, generation of a library. This will be cookie cutter. Uh, last but not least, we plan to do something that can be used for what if modeling for wave three, wave four in 2021 uh, to better understand roughly when these waves could hit us, how long they might take and what the consequences would be on the economy. So a few dashboards that we build. These dashboards are not available to the public. Uh, anyone, we also accept uh, citizen data scientists or individuals to sign up on the Emergent Alliance if uh, they want to be part of the uh, undertaking. Then you could get uh, access to uh, the Cloud Pack for Data tool, which is provided provisioned by uh, IBM, which is essentially a set of uh, Jupyter notebooks running on a Kubernetes cluster and so much more uh, on this tool set. I'll leave the uh, IBM <laughs> advertisement to, to Alvaro if he feels uh, inclined to do so. Anyhow, so this is all uh, Cognos dashboards that we set up. Uh, one of them is obviously the Emergent Risk Index. Uh, that's very similar to your Cognos dashboards, but it does, to your uh, default COVID dashboards, but it does take into account more factors than just the infection numbers. It also takes into account like hospital beds, availability, that kind of thing. So it's really much more of a risk index. We also do have some limited predictive capability together with an understanding of um, where these weights, where these contributions for the prediction comes from. So it's about explainable uh, machine learning, explainable AI, not just throw numbers over the fence and assume they're good. So this is the dashboard on the upper right hand side. Uh, we obviously look into uh, lockdown measures. There's a wonderful data set from Oxford University there. And in order to understand uh, fly forward capabilities, we have started to cluster these uh, government measures. So it's there similarities between uh, various governments undertaking certain lockdown measures. Can you compare one country to the other? 
or is every single com uh, country completely different? This matters a lot if you want to do fly forwards, what if modeling, like how many scenarios would you need to take into account? How many countries react in how many different ways going forward? Other pieces of work that we've done has more to do with uh, natural text processing in the broader sense. So one uh, had to do with sentiment analysis of news uh, around COVID. Uh, another one is uh, because we are Rolls Royce had to do with uh, understanding flight limitations. Can you actually travel from point A to point B and return? You may recall that uh, in the summer, uh, all of a sudden the UK issued a uh, quarantine warning for, for tourists traveling back from Spain into the UK. So it's not just good enough to be able to travel from the UK into Spain, but also you have to, you have to be able to come back without having to undergo measures. Obviously, we are in the aerospace industry, so we are pretty much hit hard by the pandemic uh, effects, of course, so it's one of our interests. And Adjacent to that, as we also started looking at uh, public data, open data uh, available from uh, Airbnb or second source around Airbnb to understand how the demand onto the uh, uh, accommodation industry has changed. So some of the dashboards that we have produced there is uh, around topics and sentiment. So it's about how frequent these topics are. Then you've got sentiment analysis, are they positive or negative? So it's not just about more news around airlines being produced, but also is this positive news or negative news? What's the tone of it? And uh, this is all laying out uh, this um, analysis of uh, certain news sources for the second quarter when we had data available for it. For um, the regional risk, we also have the notion of neighborhood relationships. So we understand how countries hang together, how states are decomposed. So how countries are decomposed into states and then states into regions. So we also understand the progression, how these things belong to each other. Country restrictions I was alluding to before, we've got dashboards where you can select a country and then you can find out, can I select from, can I fly from Germany to uh, Chile? And can I return from Chile back to Germany without going into quarantine? This is using what's called NOTAMS, Notice to Airmen. Uh, this is sort of almost publicly available data or da there's public data sources for that. This is pretty much how pilots uh, who have the ulti ultimate say whether you are allowed to board an airplane or not, how they're being advised of the current legal situations. And last but not least, uh, the uh, Airbnb, where we looked at how the overnight stays for Airbnb uh, trips has changed Ge geographically. We found that it's more on the outskirts and less on the center of the cities, but also that kind of uh, timeline you see there with these humps. This is showing the evolution uh, of bookings. So the green line would have been what uh, we, we would have predicted for Airbnb to make business and the amber line is what actually happened uh, when it comes to, came to bookings. So that's giving you a bit of a, a summary overview. And I was talking about now these two tools we're gonna home in on today. One we call the cookie cutter, and I'm gonna talk a bit about that. And fingers crossed so far, everything is still working. I give you a live demo of how it uh, looks like. So what is it, what problem are we trying to solve? Um, we are, as I said, when we set off uh, with Emerging Alliance, the idea was we trying to give an answer, like how, how long will things take? How long will the second wave or the first wave take? And right now, I think everybody has it on his mind, like how long will the lockdown measures take and what's going to happen next? So if you work with time series data and you want to do some kind of prediction, it's always best practice to take the data you already have, which is looking back in the past, and try to then find out what happened in the past. So Cookie Cutter is trying to give you some kind of view and editor where you can look back at individual countries uh, health situation and then mark it up, label it and save it so you can base anything on uh, on its outputs. Cookie Cutter is also doing a second aspect which we're going to talk a little bit about in a second. Uh, because we want to predict the uh, uh, impact of the COVID situation onto economy, we had real problems in finding data sources that would directly relate to what is the impact of onto the economy due to COVID effects. So it's like a data editor where you can sort of draw your own lines, your own graphs through the rather jiggly and incomplete data that you have available if you uh, try to find out what the impact actually is. Without doing PowerPoint battles, let me just hop over now to the actual tool. 
So uh, cookie cutter is implemented in Python. Uh, I'm a big fan of Boki and Boki server. So I had to choose Boki server for that because then it's really straightforward to deploy almost straight away uh, Python code onto web browsers and share it with others. So it's a nice server client application. So the way it works is uh, as you as you load the data is you can select from a number of data sources that have uh, been implemented so far. So you can choose the good old widely known Johns Hopkins global data source and then you can choose which country you want to look at. Let's have a look at Austria uh, uh, as an example. It then gives you the number of cases at the top end, uh, which is the number of cases were reported. It gives a drop a drop back of a rather crudely change point detector based uh, classification of whether a region would be a wave or a period of calm. Um, you can tell that uh, there is no clear definition of what a wave is and what a period of calm is. Actually, it's quite of a headache, which is also why you want to have the kind of human in the loop data labeling so that humans can lay an egg on say, okay, what I want to do, I want to save this one, I want to call this one now, I call this Austria wave one, and I'm going to save the data and it'll be saved in a data store in a database actually, so I can later then use that uh, to do whatever kind of derivations of uh, recycling the wave one data from Austria for a wave two model for Austria or wave three model for Brazil, if that's what I want to do. Below that, you see another prominent data source. Uh, that is uh, just two views of uh, a really interesting thing that has to do with government lockdown measures. It's uh, the Oxford CGRT data set. This is listing for practically all countries on the planet uh, what governments have been undertaken. It's breaking it out by various re uh, uh, dimensions, like whether schools have been closed, whether there's limitations on travel, etc. So what you see here is the individual steps. In that case, Austria has been doing. So Austria started to close the workplaces round about here, uh, sort of uh, towards the end of March 2020. And uh, the data is updated probably every week. Uh, that may happen anytime soon again. Uh, so what you see here that uh, how long this measure was put in place. Uh, the data up here is then a numerical representation of that. So Oxford went through a lot of effort in condensing, uh, summing up these data into one numerical measure between zero and 100, 100 being the most extreme government measures that you can think of. And typically heavy lockdown numbers are around about in the 80s, uh, which is what we see a lot now these days again. So if you if you select that and save that, it will also save uh, select and save the uh, other portions of the Oxford data set. Below that is another piece of work that was done by uh, an IBM colleague in Holland, uh, Damian Sweetering. And Damian uh, is applying Gumbel distribution fits to these uh, infection curves. So we all heard a lot about SIR modeling and whatever derivations you've got uh, from SIR modeling as well. Uh, Damian uh, found out that uh, a Gumbel distribution actually quite nicely fits uh, a lot of these waves in a, in a really convenient way. So this is fitting now various curves uh, over each other. And uh, what you see here, the, the red pluses, the dots here. This is sort of the smooth trend from the actual infection numbers. It's the same number as here. So it's a deseasoned uh, number. And this is the resulting curve from Damian's model. Uh, there's a bit of functionality missing on that tool. Uh, you can sort of uh, turn off some of these uh, uh, curve fits and then uh, you know, sort of remove them from the equation if you don't like uh, these curve fits. And what's missing is that number should be changing. But uh, it's almost finished. <laughs> always say with uh, these things. Um, last but not least, uh, this reminds you of the votes you've been uh, undertaken before, so you don't have to re-vote uh, too many times. And here now is something that I found really, really interesting and exciting. This is now me voting on uh, the, the world, more or less, uh, more than in a second, uh, for periods of waves and periods of calms. And this is now providing you a little bit of insight into how long a wave actually would take. This is me voting, so it's not a scientific definition. It's got, I'm an engineer by background, so I'm not a doctor. I've got limited knowledge of uh, epidemiology. But from my voting is now, I see this kind of distribution for the duration of waves that I have observed. And again, more on that in a second. And what you find out that you've got sort of, you take percentile distributions that waves typically take between 40 and 70, 80 days roundabout. 
Um, Period of calm uh, have a different distribution. They're not as pronounced, so somewhere between 50 and 150 days. The interesting thing is over there, I found. Uh, what's plotted here is the relative peak of new cases. So how many people got infected divided by 100,000 uh, of the population and how long these periods take. And what you see here, so this is the duration of the peak and this is how high it was, how many people got infected. And to my big surprise, and this is also coming out from the Gumbel distribution, by the way, is that the duration of a wave is almost independent from how many people get infected. That's really, really interesting. Uh, let's just have a look at that, whether I just made this up or not. Uh, let's just look at uh, Ireland. So Ireland just went through a second wave, which was slightly higher than the first wave. And if you look at that, lo and behold, depends on how we now call you know, what a wave is and how, what you want to mark. Uh, the, the numbers are actually somehow different, even though the second wave is slightly higher. Uh, uh, seeing is believing. Let's have a look at uh, countries like Israel, uh, where again, you see a very similar behavior. Again, it's very subjective, it's humans labeling these things, but uh, the, the wave one of Israel took that long and wave two if a draw starting point here took practically as long as wave, wave one. But it's a really interesting phenomenon. Uh, this has to do, uh, that would take longer and a lot of that is speculation on my, my understanding, is the sizes of these, how these social networks that can infect each other, how the sizes are, how many, how big a number you actually are able to interact with, and uh, also the change in behavior by people as they learn that something is happening, and then they will naturally start to self-isolate because bad things are happening on the outside. But it is an interesting thing. Now, be mindful that uh, the labeling that I've done that I just showed does not apply for uh, these kind of big waves because you can't make out uh, these waves in these big nations. It all seems to be a big mesh of something, which is another interesting insight, of course, because uh, it starts making sense if you start decomposing the nationwide waves into uh, uh, statewide waves. So obviously, uh, New York had a very pronounced wave uh, earlier this year. So it's an interesting thing that uh, looking at waves at a nation level may not make sense because waves are very local events. Uh, and you probably have to find out what the right level of uh, abstraction is in order to make out how long such an infection wave actually takes. This is also why overlaying this with these Gumbel distributions I found very useful because you do see an awful lot of these uh, waves that are just one after the other and they're all rather compact but they all are having similar durations which I find really really amazing. Another bit uh, just uh, for the sake of it, you see that a lot in some of the data sets. You always see this, these blips around here. So you see those blips uh, around there. So this is just looking at data. Uh, and let's just look at some of these. Uh, so you always see these small blips. I can also look at that in the, uh, sorry, we need to look at that. You see that an awful lot uh, also in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, you always see these tiny blips around uh, summer. So uh, at the time, most people were thinking uh, that these blips were due to an increased testing of people returning uh, from uh, a holiday. But now in hindsight, this is why I love, uh, really enjoy looking at uh, these, uh, 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 the data in hindsight. In hindsight, these were probably all very small waves, very local, but uh, they must have been around. So you see always these tiny waves there. Uh, it was probably some kind of small wave uh, and this has to do, it always happens around August-ish time frame towards the end of summer holidays. So uh, again, this is just, uh, I'm speculating a bit, but this is, uh, I'm not, this is just the data talking. So that's one aspect and uh, the rest is just usability. Uh, there's going to be a, a readme out there, which I'm, <laughs> <laughs> that's we're trying to update. So this is trying to, the purpose that we're trying to do is try to capture wave one, calm one, wave two data for various nations, such that we begin to understand what happens, how, how long these waves takes, how high they are, what the government measures were, were active when this wave happened. So that's one key thing if you want to model now, say 2021, that's one key aspect. Second aspect you need is how the economy reacts to that. Uh, said before, 
and uh, this is now required for the next model that Alvaro is going to talk a bit about before. We try to understand, again, I think everybody has a kind of question in their head, like what's going to happen to restaurants, what's going to happen to uh, tourism, uh, all kinds of industries around uh, event management and all these things. So we, we try to be data driven. So obviously we were looking around an awful lot for data sources. And as I mentioned before, some of those data sources, they come in very, very late, like GDP numbers come in like almost two months after the end of the quarter. Um, so in order to bridge that gap, but also because the data was very jiggly, uh, I found that uh, trying to uh, smooth the heck out of it by applying all kinds of filters and whatever, it's just as useful to just have a graphical editor. So this is the second part of cookie cutter. You can sort of capture, you can load relevant uh, uh, economic data and then by just using a cursor, you can just draw your own line through it. So what we look at here is a data set uh, from the Transport Safety Authority in the US, which is telling us the number of passengers through safety uh, checks in, in the US. And the purpose of Cookie Cutter here is now to have a, some kind of data editor where you can just choose a, a, a reference data set and just put your own curve through it and you're going to see in, in a moment why these red numbers are why these red dots are labeled red so that's the sort of the shock to the economy and why the green ones are labeled green that's sort of the recovery but that's sort of uh, then you begin to understand how deep the impact has been on in that case aerospace and yes it has been uh, that deep so uh, aerospace business collapsed to levels like that now you can now load multiple data sets. So let's just overlay that with, uh, say, Eurocontrol. Uh, this is the number of flights in Europe uh, uh, measured. So it's just a number of flights, it's not the passengers. Data before was passengers. And you can just now start playing with the data. So maybe you, you now think, OK, maybe I was uh, too conservative here. And that always happens on the demo, right? Uh, come on, just be gentle to me. It's not the world's best most user-friendly editor, I should say. But uh, And then maybe you just want to change that curve and maybe you just want to put these numbers somewhere else and, and just see whether this all makes sense. So this is sort of the idea for that because smoothing is so hard because the data sets are so different. Um, uh, so there is, for example, things around uh, GDP that I mentioned before which has a completely different envelope uh, and, and what have you can be quite confusing. And because I could, uh, I finally also found my, my most uh, uh, favorite uh, data set, which we were all wanting to have, which is the toilet paper sales uh, earlier this year. So uh, again, this is now swinging up, but uh, it's unfortunately incomplete. <laughs> so I don't know how it progresses uh, progress for the remainder of the year, but there's a wonderful data set out there. We can also look at, uh, I think it was, uh, was there pizza uh, on there? Let's just look at that and see what happened here. Oh, wow. It's an interesting one. <laughs> uh, yeast, uh, yeah, that collapsed. So anyhow, so there's lots of data sets out there. The way it's been deployed, uh, I said, this is a, a dockerizable container, uh, which you can deploy, which comes with its own SQL database and a set of notebooks where you can download these data so you can refresh it. And this uh, tool is trying to answer the question and like, what was the impact onto the economy in the absence of actual accurate data where you need to apply some kind of engineering understanding and how to actually do that. Um, that was the end of my part. I'm just gonna pass over now, hand over to uh, Alvaro, who's gonna talk to you about the second tool. Yeah, um, well, thank you, Klaus. Um, let me share my screen now. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. So um, yeah, um, I want to talk about the, the emergent economic engine. So um, um, by the way, I'm, I'm Alvaro Corrales. I'm a data scientist at IBM and well, I have a background in economics and that's perhaps why I was working on this part of the project. Um, so really the idea, the idea behind the emergent economic engine it was to, to try to understand how uh, the pandemic had affected uh, had affected um, the different sectors of the economy. Um, the reason is that, uh, as everybody knows these days, uh, not all the sectors of the economy was uh, were affected in the same way. So there were sectors like uh, uh, transport or like accommodation that went uh, down basically by a hundred percent or ninety percent, whereas other sectors didn't really suffer that much. 
So uh, coming from that understanding of the reality, we wanted to kind of uh, see, uh, we wanted to kind of model how, uh, how one shock to one sector of the economy would propagate throughout the rest of the, se and the sectors of the economy, um, depending on how connected this sector was with the rest of the network. Uh, to do that, we used, uh, we used uh, what is called in economics, uh, Leontief Input Output Model. And the basic idea behind this model is that um, all sectors of the economy are connected through input output linkages. So what's an input output linkage? Well, the, the idea behind an input output linkage is that what one sector of the economy produces is consumed by another sector of the economy. So when you generalize this idea to the whole economy, then you get a uh, some sort of uh, network where uh, everything is connected with everything. Uh, and then uh, from there, you can just switch off one, one sector of the economy and see what happens with the rest. Um, this Leontief input output model was, uh, is kind of a very well known model in, in economics these days, but uh, it wasn't suitable for our, for our case uh, uh, for one reason, or it wasn't, uh, it wasn't suitable as, as it was in, in theory for one reason is that, uh, it didn't give us a time kind of view of, uh, of the world. And we wanted to understand how shocks propagated in time as well. Um, so we implemented a kind of a, a more developed version uh, based on, on literature as well, on existing literature, where uh, that is defined in, in this equation here, which is basically telling us that uh, the change in the, the change in, in the input, uh, or, or sorry, on, of the output of an economy, is a function of, uh, of uh, certain economic shocks that change in time and also certain counter shocks. Um, the sh um, when you think about the shocks, uh, we, it would be basically um, perhaps your understanding on, of how the economy is, uh, is falling these days or how a particular sector has been affected. It could also come from cookie cutter from the second functionality that Klaus mentioned. And then the counter shock, even though it's, uh, it's kind of um, mathematically a similar thing would be a different a different uh, concept it would be uh, how how an economy is affected by uh, a government deciding to kind of uh, pump money into certain sectors in particular and then we're left with this uh, with this factor here with this uh, component which is the input output coefficients so uh, perhaps not surprisingly and because uh, economists are not very imaginative the Leontief input output model uses uh, uses one kind of uh, very, um, very essential type of data, which is called uh, input output tables. So what an input output table is uh, this flow, uh, this flow representation of the economy that I just talked about. So what one sector produces is consumed by another sector. Uh, you have, a, you have a, uh, some sort of a schematic version of, of uh, this, uh, this type of data in, uh, in this uh, chart here. Um, in this case, it's coming from the OECD that produces input output tables from uh, for uh, lots of different uh, countries, but uh, you could also have it for, for specific countries in, in such as the UK, and you also have Spain, the US, and most, uh, most of the countries in the, in the Western world. Um, so this is like the theoretical framework that we, that we developed, but obviously things are not just like that. We also have uh, we also have the emergent economic engine itself, which is uh, which is a, an app that we developed to kind of generalize uh, the idea of transmitting shocks, propagating them through, throughout the economic network. Uh, the basic idea behind the emergent economic engine is to play with the with the two uh, shock parameters or the shock and counter shock parameters of of our model, and uh, to kind of simulate different scenarios depending on what your belief. Or your, or your understanding of the, of the economy is. So uh, we have divided them into levers. Basically, lever one relates to the shock and lever two relates to the counter shock. So in the case of lever one, you can choose your shock profile that can come from, uh, from cookie cutter, from your understanding. And uh, the app will give you how much output changes for, uh, for a given shock. Um, and then in lever two, you can say, okay, uh, I don't want my economy to fall this much, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pump resources into it, and I'm going to um, I'm going to try to countermeasure the shock that I am that uh, it is suffering. I'm gonna show you a demo. Um, I'm gonna show you a demo now because it's not, obviously not that. <laughs> I, I don't want to kill you by by just uh, showing you slides. Um, just so you know, the, the code is on GitHub, and you also have a, a beta version uh, deployed at the moment. 
So you can also play with it if you want. And um, without further ado, let me show you the, the app. Um, so this is like, this is basically the, um, this is the homepage of the, the Emergent Economic Engine. Actually, I'm going to refresh because I was testing it just for the presentation. Um, here we're using the, the UK, the UK input output tables. Um, you can, we're going to, we're going to make available other input output tables as well, um, such as the US, uh, OECD, um, um, I think we also have Germany, but really you can, you can take it from basically everywhere. Um, like really like statistical offices around the world produce these tables. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's play the simulation. Let's say that we want to run this simulation for eight years. Um, and then the, we're gonna, this is a bit of a technical concept, um, but let's say that we want to uh, propagate a shock to the economy upstream. So this means that uh, it, it's gonna go upstream the supply chain of all the sectors that we shock. It can also go downstream, but uh, the results uh, will be very similar. And then let's say that uh, for a period of uh, 12 months, all the sectors of the economy stop producing about 10% of, of the regular output. So this means that uh, perhaps uh, because people uh, cannot, uh, cannot work uh, from their workplaces or be, they have to work from home or some people cannot even go to work, uh, all sectors have to stop producing by 10% for one year. And then let's say that uh, there are certain, there's a particular sector that actually is uh, shot by more than that. So air transport, as Klaus showed, um, fell considerably more than 10%. Let's say it's uh, about 75% for also 12 months. So what you see in this chart is basically how the shocks have propagated throughout the whole U of the UK economy. So each line is a, is a sector of the economy. And as you can see, um, not, once, not two sectors are the same. So because sectors are connected differently with each other, then even though all of them initially were set to fall 10%, because one sector is gonna be more connected than the, than the rest, then it's gonna fall more. So for instance, wholesale trade is connected with a, a wide array, uh, a wide array of, uh, of um, sectors in the economy, so it falls by more. And uh, similarly with uh, financial services and so on, which fall more than, other like uh, imputed uh, brands of foreign occupied dwellings. Um, the whole idea is that uh, there is a diversity, there is a there is a kind of um, there is a wealth of uh, of reactions to just uh, one particular economic shock. You can also see uh, sectors in particular. You can also compare um, a couple of sectors and, and um, whichever you are you are most uh, interested about. And, um, and the tool will also show you how much the economy falls for this uh, eight years that we are simulating. So in this case, it will be 20%, uh, which means that if you don't do anything for eight years, this shock will be felt uh, quite substantially and the economy will fall by 20%. And this is a summary of, uh, of how much each sector will fall in total. But as you probably remember, there were two levers in this, uh, in this tool. And the second lever is, is really optional. And I made it optional because, well, you don't need to pump any money into the economy. Although perhaps you, you probably want in most of the cases if you are a government. So let's say that you have a, a pool of resources and you want to, and you just want the economy to fall by less. And in particular, in this case, since we're talking about the UK, uh, let's say that uh, we're gonna introduce about 8% uh, extra resources to the economy for a period of five months, one month after the shock started. The reason why I choose these parameters in particular is because they are very similar to, to the kind of um, stimulus that uh, the UK government passed. Um, so by the end of the, well, during the summer. And what you see in the in this chart is the is the result of your stimulus. So uh, in the in the light line, you see the no intervention scenario. This is how much your economy will fall if nothing happens, if you just leave it and don't stimulate it at all. And the light, and sorry, and the dark one will be the economy in the intervention scenario with so with this kind of profile of intervention. As you can see, I mean, we are not magicians and we don't have all the resources in the world. So the economy still falls, but it obviously falls by less and it falls and it recovers uh, faster. You can also check particular sectors. Um, let's say, let's, let's look at air transport. 
obviously because air transport fell by a lot, it almost doesn't feel the, the stimulus, but then again, you can also target specific sectors when you when you um, design your, your stimulus. So let's say that I want to give the, the air transport sector a subsidy that is equivalent to say 15% of, uh, of its total production uh, for a period of 12 uh, months. Um, you can also do that with a tool and you will see the same result. Like again, output falls, but it falls by less and then the uh, transport sector recovers faster. Um, so th this is really the tool. Um, let me go back to my to my presentation. Um, so if you're interested in the in the emergent alliance, uh, here's the here's the website. Here's a, a link to the website. Uh, we have published a lot of uh, blogs as well a lot on on our findings. So I really recommend you to to have a look at them if you are interested. Um, you can also you can also contact the emergent alliance to join if you want. Uh, like Paul said at the beginning, we're very happy to, to uh, engage with citizen data scientists. So uh, please contact us if you want. And we also have a GitHub repo. So if you are interested in, in what we have talked about or, um, today, you can go to the GitHub repo and, and please own it and or even give us, uh, give us uh, feedback on what you think. Um, and yeah, and maybe just enjoy, enjoy exploring it. So uh, that's uh, that's all on my side, and yeah, I hope you you enjoy it. And yeah, I'm. Um, I guess we can open the discussion to, to questions. Great, thank you. Do we have any question? Yeah. So hey. Right. Yes, uh, I have uh, three questions. Uh, the first two are for Klaus. Uh, yeah, very interesting data analysis. Uh, and when you were talking about duration of a wave, uh, I had a question about that. Did you also check how the duration of a wave changed in time? So if I index each wave, and if I go through each of these waves, how does the duration of a wave change? Unfortunately, there is. Um, it's a good question. So it's a bit of a fractal problem. So I'm still struggling to find out what is the right size of a country entity to actually find a wave. So, for example, I think that for example, in Berlin, things like uh, like Neukölln, so a level below the city, where you get probably a quarter of a million-ish people, quarter million, half a million people, seems to be a reasonable size. Anything below that. Uh, the number of infected people uh, is because it's integers and you know increments of one. Uh, the numbers are not your friend. So mathematics, numerics don't help you. Anything above that, you've got these multiple waves. So I still haven't finished that. But as I said on on the course picture, it seems to be very very similar, and it seems to be almost independent of uh, the waves. Now keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. From a nation point of view, there's only so many nations who've been going through a clear wave too. So it's Ireland, Israel, uh, uh, Australia, which had a slightly different setup, uh, Japan, and two or three more. I think Holland and Belgium are sort of going through that uh, wave as well. We're a bit unfortunate if you want to actually be data driven. Unfortunately, you have to wait for the first of a kind events to happen. And then for a few of them before you have any statistical significance. But as a, to my big surprise, the fact that uh, a second wave is three, four, five times stronger, like it was in Israel, than the first one, didn't change uh, the, the duration of it. Yeah. It might have just extended it just a little bit, uh, but not ne nowhere near, just to 110% probably of the wave one, so it's practically uh, uh, independent. And uh, the second one was about mortality rate. I don't know if you looked at the data, but I wonder uh, if the mortality rate between the waves are damped. Because in biology, there is a saying that the virus reduces its mortality rate because it wants to survive himself or itself. Uh, I wonder if you checked that. So uh, we had the original, <clears throat> so um, there, there is unfortunately in our case, now the data sources weren't our friend. Uh, you could derive mortality rate from Johns Hopkins data because Johns Hopkins have a, a, a mortality or recovery together with a timestamp. 
because I also ingested RKI data in Germany. RKI, for some strange reason, they only publish, uh, they don't publish timestamp with the event of, uh, with a mortality event. They just, they have a line list for each patient, more or less. And all they do is they just say, this patient has a disease and there's no timestamp. So unfortunately from RKI, don't ask me why, you can't compute mortality over time. Uh, you can only compute total mortality and sort of it's a, a, not even its evolution over time because the, the complete, uh, when people have recovered or not. So it could be brought back. So you could take, uh, you could look at the uh, data out of cookie cutter, which is just the beginning and an end date really. And then bolt it onto data sources which would have that kind of information. But uh, unfortunately, because I wanted to integrate this data source into one editor, uh, I had to cut down on, on both recovered and uh, deceased numbers. Uh, it would be very interesting because we all know, I think uh, mortality could be, is, is probably more of uh, a social function on which country is affected, that kind of stuff. Then, uh, and then there's different strands of viruses, at least there were initially, I haven't followed them recently, but I haven't exploited that. That's a good point. Uh, maybe just compare that. Uh, this question was motivated by just uh, an observation in uh, the website of Morgan Post. Uh, they have this mortality rate per, uh, as a function of time. And I was saying, although Germany has this second wave, but the mortality magnitude was not changed. Uh, that was, so that, that comes from that observation. And uh, I have one last question to Alvaro. Um, uh, in the model in this uh, ODE that you had, uh, uh, you had some parameters, right? That yeah. uh, I couldn't completely follow uh, all of them. Uh, but uh, did you find some combinations that, uh, that generates an interesting output? Uh, so, or in other words, did you run some optimization for which parameters you can, I don't know, get, uh, I don't know, get uh, a positive output over time? Maybe let me let me share my screen again. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so the, so this this is the equation that you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, really, so the um, the. Um, the parameters of the equation are actually given by uh, by theory. So, so you, you've got this a, which comes from the input output table, the, yeah, the input output tables, and um, it, it's uh, it's um, it, it comes from what the data from the national statistical office of the country that you are downloading the input output tables from. So, um, it's it's just a transformation, but it, it's a matrix operation. There's no optimization there or anything. So uh, in a way, you're, you, you have to believe uh, you have to believe that the economic model is, uh, is representing the reality well, and that uh, these input output these input output tables are already showing you the reality. So there, there is really no optimization behind it. And in terms of the policy, because you had also this um, uh, when I talk about parameter, I mean that policy that you had this government policy uh, in in your simulation. Uh, when, when you are playing with that, I don't know, variable, the policy, did you find certain regions where uh, you get, I don't know, positive output or a desirable outcome? So the, the, desirable, the desirable outcome really depends on what, uh, on what the user of the tool believes is a desirable outcome. So the user of the tool can be a, um, can be a um, public authority, such as the government, and perhaps what the government wants was to is not to kind of uh, lose jobs in one particular sector, in which case you may you may want to you may want to pump resources into that sector or sectors beside beside. So maybe it's very difficult to, for instance, give money to to big airlines, but uh, it may make sense if you want to save the whole tourism industry of your country. So because these uh, these sectors are very very well connected. Um, you, you may want to give money to, to the airlines. So um, what, I, what I found very, very interesting is precisely these, these links are, are quite clear in the model when you, 
when you play with uh, with uh, this with certain sectors such as the air transport sector, it really so basically if the air transport sector falls by a lot, then uh, tourism and travel travel agencies um, are gonna are gonna fall as well a lot. So uh, really, the desirable part is something that you define as a user, mm -hmm. but uh, but there, there is clearly certain links that are that are very worthwhile exploring as a user, such as this connection. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's quite interesting if you couple this uh, model with uh, objective function, so it would be an optimization, optimal control. So you can see which policy would actually resolve to a desirable outcome. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, actually, um, we, th this is something we haven't developed um, yet, mm -hmm. I would say, but uh, um, then there were talks about, about precisely this um, you know, control theory and, and yeah, optimization. Yeah, they, and, uh, it's really close naturally. And one last question. And when you uh, talked about coupling of different businesses or, business, uh, or different industries, mm -hmm. um, where does it appear in the model? Is it in the matrix? Yeah, so, uh, so here, so it, it, the kind of the network relationship is, uh, okay. is, uh, is given by the input output table. So in this input output table, so here I'm, imagine that we only have one country, right? So in this row, in, in this row, you have uh, the, a, a productive sector. So what, what this sector, this industry one produces, and in each of the columns, you will have how much, um, how much of the output of, set, of industry one is consumed by the rest of the industry. So that, that is how you define the relationship. Yeah. Cool, thank you, thank you very much.